Okay, so good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to uh, this month's Open Access Australasia webinar for May 2023. Thank you very much for joining us all. I'd like to begin with just a couple of points of housekeeping and also um, an acknowledgement of country. I'm joining you today from the lands of the Bedical people, and I would like to acknowledge the people that are the traditional custodians of this land and to pay my respects to their leaders past and present and extend that welcome to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples joining us today. So some practicalities before we be begin today's webinar. It will be recorded uh, and will be available on our website with the slides. If you're not one of the presenters today, if you could please uh, keep your microphone muted, especially when you join the meeting, um, turn off your camera to help with the bandwidth. And if you have a question today, we will just be using the chat function in Zoom and we'll be uh, organising a Q&A session after Rachel's presentation. And we will finish at or just before um, the hour, which is uh, it's 1 p.m. here on the um, East Coast. So before handing over to today's presenter, just a brief overview of um, who we are. So Open Access Australasia um, now has 31 university members across Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. We also have strong partnerships with Creative Commons Australasia, Tahoe in um, New Zealand, Alia, Australian Digital Alliance, Wikimedia, Citizen Science, NASLA, and others. Um, we have an executive committee of which I'm one of the members. My name is Fiona Bradley and I'm from UNSW Sydney. And you can see the details of my colleagues on this screen. And we are very ably led by, uh, 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 by our staff, Director Jeannie Baba and Sandra, as well as other staff. So some of our priorities and work that we're doing is very much in the space of advancing principles around equity and scholarly communication, access to research, diverse ecosystems of open access approaches, um, integrity and other things that uh, you are able to read on the screen. Please visit our website for further information. Um, our work is very much centred around advocacy, collaboration with other bodies, both nationally and internationally, to raise awareness and build capacity for open access and open science across Australasia. Um, and some of the outputs and activities that we have um, produced recently, you can see on this screen. So today's presentation, I'm really delighted um, that we have been joined by Rachel Bickley, who is the co-founder of the eBooks SOS campaign. Um, so Rachel is uh, the newly appointed manager of research engagement at the University of Adelaide and one of the founders of the eBooks SOS campaign. She moved to Australia in 2022 from the UK, where she had previously been working at London Metropolitan University Library, supporting teacher teaching, learning and research. And prior to that, she had academic library positions in various universities across the UK. Her interests include open access publishing, research impact, critical and sustainable collection development, and critical pedagogy. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome Rachel to our webinar today. Um, as you will hear from Rachel, the story of this campaign is very relevant to us here in Australia, not only as an example of, of some of the similar issues that we and our library users are facing in terms of access to ebooks, but also um, an incredibly inspiring story of how we can work together to advocate for change from the grassroots all the way up. So I very much look forward to um, Rachel's presentation and hearing suggestions from attendees here about how um, perhaps we could take this forward through Open Access Australasia and with other organisations. So uh, with that, I will now hand over to Rachel, um, stop sharing my slides and over to you. Thank you so much, Fiona. I'm, I'm really, really happy to be here today. So I'm going to um, share mine now. Um, just give me a second.
All right, there we go. And I'll just pop my video off as well, just to save the bandwidth. Okay. Um, thanks everybody for coming to listen to what I have to say today. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, as Fiona said, um, I work for the University of Adelaide Library. I'm um, very recently manager of research engagement. I just started last week. Um, prior to that, I was the liaison librarian here. So before I get started, sorry, my computer's being a little slow. There we go. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the Ghana people, the traditional custodians whose ancestral lands I live, work and play on here, land which was never ceded. So this is me, um, so I'm talking to you today, so you can see me here. Um, I also wanted to um, briefly introduce um, my two other uh, co-founders as well. Um, so obviously they're not here today because it's the middle of the night back in the UK. Um, but Johanna Anderson is um, the person who started it all, really. So she was the one who said um, she'd like to found this, start this off, and, and Caroline and I answered her call. So Johanna is a subject librarian at the University of Gloucestershire. She is a very long time advocate for libraries, and she's led and been involved in so many other campaigns um, within the UK, including things like Friends of Gloucestershire Libraries and Voices for the Library, which were advocating for public libraries, which really um, came under a lot of pressure um, since 2010 when the Conservative government came in. And Caroline Ball is an academic librarian at the University of Derby. So she's the other co-founder, along with myself. We answered Johanna's call to get this going. And Caroline is also a senior fellow of the Higher Education Academy. She's a copyright expert, a Wikimedia UK trustee, and was UK Wikimedian of the Year in 2020. Okay, so um, before I get started with talking, so I've got quite a lot to say. Um, I thought I would show you this little video. Hopefully it plays okay. If the sound isn't working, that's all right. It's just music. Um, you can get what you need to see from the screen. So this is a fantastic video that Caroline made for us. It's ebook SOS, e -book SOS in slightly over one minute, um, but it's something we use a lot to explain what the campaign is. So that's what the campaign is. Um, I think it's also important to clarify what ebook SOS is not as well. So we're not an organisation or an institution or a body of any kind. We're just three regular people. Um, none of us is a senior leader in the field, either in the UK or anywhere else. We're not paid to do this. So this has been entirely voluntary on top of our day jobs. And really importantly, we do not have the answers. Um, we're just kind of trying to get this uh, out into the kind of landscape and get people talking about it because we really believe that part of our kind of ethical moral duties in the work that we do in providing access to information is to make sure that access is equitable um, and make sure that we are thinking about things like where we spend our funds as well so this is really just motivated um, by us believing that it's something that we need to do. 
So a little bit of background about um, how it came about. So we're going to go all the way back to March 2020, um, when, of course, as we all know, that's when the COVID pandemic um, really came about in a lot of the world. Um, back in the UK, we were put into lockdown at the end of March 2020 by the government. Uh, and part of that was um, a decree that physical library sites, buildings like that in the UK, physical university campuses needed to close completely. So everything needed to move online. So the students had to completely rely on the online content that we had. We couldn't even at that point, you know, do a, a scanning service or a fetching service because we weren't allowed on campus at all. Um, in the UK, the academic year runs from around September, October through to about May, June. Um, so in March, that's the time when everyone is doing dissertations and final projects. So it really was a very crucial time of the year um, when the students were kind of forced into using online content only. And obviously, with these issues about ebooks with affordability, availability and access for university libraries had always been around. But this really brought it into focus because we had no print option at all. It all had to be online. So if we got into kind of summer 2020, so in the UK, that's sort of June, July, August, um, it really became apparent that, you know, even if restrictions were lifted a little bit in the UK, this, this state of things of everything being pretty much online was definitely going to continue into the new academic year starting in September. Um, and sort of academic librarians around the UK, you know, we were talking on Twitter and we were all finding, we were all sort of working with our lecturers and really kind of trying to advise them on how you get your reading list, you know, in a way that can all be accessed online, which of course isn't necessarily the best way to, to um, put together a reading list in terms of, you know, learning and teaching. Um, so this was really what prompted us to take some action. So we put together a, an open letter which calls on the UK government to investigate the practices of the academic ebook publishing industry in the UK. So this was published on a Friday afternoon, September 2020. By Sunday, it attracted over 250 signatures. Within one week, it had over 1,000. And today, I did check this morning, that stands at 5,104 signatures. And this is not just librarians and library workers, it's students, it's lecturers, we've got some um, vice chancellors, heads of service, even the CEO of Creative Commons signed it. So that really kind of emphasised the scope of the issue, that it wasn't just us librarians noticing it as well. And we got quite a lot of media coverage as well. So um, here's just uh, a few um, Kind of screenshots. So we were covered in the BBC on the BBC News website. That's Johanna sitting in, I think it was her neighbour's living room. Um, we also were covered in the Guardian. So that's the price gouging from COVID uh, article there. Um, we wrote in the Times Higher Education and another UK publication called Wonky. And we actually even trended on Reddit World News for a little while after the Guardian um, article came out. So I've got a little screenshot of um, that post on Reddit as well. So it really did you know, capture a lot of people's imagination and it really did um, you know, have a lot of people come out and say, actually, this is an issue, not just within the library, but within the universities and even in the general public as a whole. So we'd written this letter aimed at the Education Select Committee asked them to run this investigation. In November 2020, they replied to us and said that they do not have the capacity to undertake this review. But we didn't say okay then and stop there, so we just took some further action. So we made a submission to the Competitions and Markets Authority, the CMA. This is the competition regulator in the UK. It's a non-ministerial government department who is responsible for strengthening business competition and preventing and reducing anti-competitive anti activities. So quite a lot of the cases that they look into are around mergers and what they call civil cartels, where an industry is behaving in an anti-competitive way, which we felt was totally the case with the UK academic ebook publishing industry. So we put that submission in. Some CMA representatives came along to attend a webinar that Johanna spoke at in March 2021. And we also met with them online in April and continue to stay in touch right up to now via email. We did continue to put pressure on the university's minister at the time was Michelle Donnellan. We did this via members of parliament. So my member of parliament in North London at the time was fantastic. 
um, and he understood the issue straight away and he put a written question into Michelle Donnellan. Um, unfortunately, her responses to any of these questions really demonstrated that she didn't understand the issue. So my MP asked her if she was going to investigate and she responded talking about some recent changes that had placed a zero rate of VAT, that's like GST here in Australia, value added tax, on e-publications, which was actually nothing to do with the issues that we were raising. So she really didn't get it at all. Um, then in May 2021, we were contacted by a Department for Education advisor who wanted to meet with us to know more about the issues with a view to preparing a briefing paper for the university's minister, Michelle Donnellan. And when we met with this advisor, it revealed that actually um, all of our questions and our requests had kind of been passed around departments because the Department for Education just didn't understand the issue. And they kind of saw it as being like a tech issue. So they kind of passed it on to another government department um, who also dismissed it because rightly it wasn't their domain. So it's been passed around a lot until somebody actually thought of getting in touch with us to actually find out why we'd put it into them, like why it was an education issue. Um, so this was an opportunity to help them understand the issues, you know, the impact on students um, and the impact on universities. So we met with this advisor. Um, unfortunately, you know, over a year passed and we just didn't hear anything back from them at all, um, even though we had chased. Um, and then um, 2022 happened. Um, so there's a bit of a timeline here. So in June 2022, last year, we discovered entirely by accident that Michelle Donnellan, the university's minister, was planning a roundtable meeting of supposed stakeholders to discuss the ebook issue that we had raised and search for solutions. Now, we only found this out because one of our supporters, who was sort of suspicious about the lack of contact that we'd had after this meeting, put in a freedom of information request to find out whether the Department for Education or the Minister had been speaking to anyone in the publishing industry about the issues that we had raised. And then we found out this meeting had been arranged and not only had we not been invited, but we did some digging and we found out that key stakeholders from the library side of things like SILIP, the professional body, hadn't been invited either and they knew nothing about it. Um, so there really didn't seem to be any kind of library representation here. So we tried going back to the advisor we'd met with to, you know, express our concerns that this was essentially going to be a meeting of the publishers and the minister with no library voice on the side. And this time he did reply to us um, with some very dismissive comments about how grateful they were that we had raised the issue, um, but that the meeting needed to be, quote, solutions focused, you know, as if we hadn't done anything towards searching for a solution. Um, the tone was very much that we three little ladies had done our bit and now it was time to get the grown-ups to take over. Um, obviously incredibly frustrating. Um, later on in the year, we did put in a, a further freedom of information request, which actually revealed um, that an advisor, an unnamed advisor, had briefed the minister on the topic of the meeting and the topic of, quote, additional participants. And they said that these additional participants may seek to resurface issues that have already been discussed and that um, the minister wanted this meeting to be one in which all participants could speak freely and work collaboratively towards resolution. So very much implying that these additional participants, aka us, would be a barrier to that. Um, and they also said, you know, following discussion about inviting additional attendees, meaning us, they were advising on the risk to this approach. So essentially, you know, we were seen as a risk to be, a threat to be risk assessed. Um, so, you know, three hysterical women looking to shout a lot and get in the way of freedom of speech and collaborating to find solutions. Um, so obviously we were really, really cross about this, very frustrated. Um, we were just kind of sketching out a plan to actually turn up at the Department for Education building in London, in Whitehall, on the day of the meeting um, with some of our supporters and, and essentially protest being left out. Um, and then on 6th of July, um, there was a lot going on at this time during government. So um, Prime Minister Boris Johnson um, had, you know, he was amidst a series of ethics scandals. Um, members of his cabinet were kind of dropping like flies as they resigned in protest of him staying in power and not resigning. And um, Michelle Donnellan had remained very loyal. And so on the 6th of July, she was promoted to the position of Secretary of State for Education. Um, so just as we're wondering what that means for this planned meeting, 
the next day, 7th of July, less than 24 hours into her new role, she did a complete 180 and resigned totally from the cabinet, saying that she couldn't continue to serve under Boris Johnson and she felt that she had to resign. So she's completely gone now totally from the cabinet, from education, from the university's minister. So this meeting never actually happened in the end. Um, and then, as you might be aware, the next few months were quite chaotic in British politics. Uh, I'm not going to talk about it. Um, I haven't got time today. Um, it's kind of nicely encapsulated in this silly news story I put on the slide about a lettuce that outlasted the reign of Liz Truss, who took over from Boris Johnson as PM for 49 days before resigning after making a further mess. So um, all of this uh, really put a halt to our attempts with that kind of government side of things to, to get an investigation because there was just too much going on. There were ministers missing from the education um, department and you know all of that. So we still kept going. We did, um, we did send a new letter to the Education Select Committee um, we were without a minister for universities for a while, um, but once things seemed to have settled down more generally in the Department of Education, we did try again, didn't get any response. Um, we were still and still are submitting evidence to the Competition and Market Authority, so we still send stuff to them. Um, you know, evidence of, of what we see as being that kind of anti-competitive behaviour. And lots of other things have come out of the campaign too. So it started as trying to get this inquiry with the open letter. But it really snowballed really quickly and it's become so much more about other things that we've done and things that we're currently doing and other things we've been involved with. And I've got way too many things to share in the time that I have. So the next few, few slides are just a few examples of some of the things we've done, been involved in, some of the conversations that we've been involved in um, around this issue of access to books as well. So um, we've, you know, in 2021, 2022, um, we addressed quite a bit this question of critical collection development and critical practice in libraries. Um, so as I kind of alluded to at the start, we've always said from the start of this campaign that we, one of the reasons we're doing it is that because we feel that as librarians, we have an ethical duty to be speaking up about issues around access to information and to be making ethical decisions in how we spend our funds to develop our collections. And so we presented at some conferences, for example, so the Critical Approaches to Libraries Conference, we talked very much about critical collection development. Um, I spoke last year at LILAC, which is a, a massive information literacy conference in the UK, um, on information literacy as activism and that kind of ethical side of um, speaking up and, and that kind of side of things in being a librarian as well. Um, and we also, you know, found through some of these discussions and these conferences, actually from, you know, 2020, 2021 onwards, some academic librarians had, libraries had already started updating their collection development policies to really preference open access material or material that was bought from publishers which were charging a fair price, not putting really restricted licenses on the material and that kind of thing. And actually some libraries started looking at it as a result of the ebook SOS campaign. So at my old place, we had started thinking about this as well. Um, did we need to update our collection development policy um, to really make sure that there was that ethical side reflected in it? Another great thing that, that we arranged as well is in May 2021, a group of volunteer experts, um, completely in their own time, created a guide called Can My Students Read My Books? I put the link on the slide here. So this is aimed at academics who are uh, teaching university, want to publish a monograph, and also, of course, want their students to be able to read it. So it's showing them the issues and saying, actually, are you sure that your student will be able to buy the ebook for your students to read? And it even includes questions they can ask their publisher and even clauses they can try and get into their publishing contract. Um, this is on the ebook SOS site. It's a Creative Commons published type of material, so it can be used and adapted by anyone. So at my old place, for example, we made our own version, was slightly tailored to our university to keep on our staff zone. Um, so anyone is very welcome to make their own version of that or link out to it. Something else that we've been able to do is actually, you know, getting into the publishing world and working alongside publishers and working with publishers. Um, so there's just a few examples here. So, for example, I co-authored an article with Lucy Barnes, who is an editor at Open Book Publishers, which is a UK based open access uh, book press, on how we envisage from both our viewpoints that open access could shake up ebook publishing. So how that's one thing that we should be looking more into. 
And then Johanna has been on a panel at the Independent Publishers Guild Spring Conference. Uh, we were shortlisted for an Open Publishing Award. Um, Johanna has recently met with a researcher for the Publishers Association in the UK, which is looking at the academic ebook market. Um, and also this year, um, Caroline was quoted in a Wired article, which was actually about um, the recent case with the Internet Archive um, and their um, publishing things, making things available online during the pandemic. Um, this article, to be honest, isn't great. So it kind of claims to look at the issues raised by the recent court case against the Internet Archive. Um, and it's supposed to look at it from different viewpoints. And Caroline's quoted in support of the Internet Archive and controlled digital lending, which is great. Um, but this article does contain some fairly wild and unsubstantiated claims presented in there from other people um, about library e-lending being damaging to authors and that kind of thing. And they haven't really addressed um, any of the kind of questions that, that people have put to them after that. Um, so just a warning, it's not a great article, but we did get in there, we did get quoted um, as one of the viewpoints. We've also been involved in um, putting pressure on particular publishers in certain situations. Um, so these examples here are not, you know, just ebook SOS. We can't claim credit for these. These are things that we've been involved in that our supporters um, have that have sort of actioned as well. So just a couple of examples. Um, back in 2021, um, Stephen Grace, who is the deputy head of library and learning resources at London South Bank University and one of our supporters, um, made a complaint to Pearson. Um, because they've noticed at LSBU that some ebooks published by Pearson and bought by a ProQuest ebook central had entirely removed the ability to print or download portions of the book. And in some cases, the library had only recently bought a copy of this same title that had had a 5% allowance. Um, they were really unhappy with these license conditions, and Stuart, uh, apologies, Stephen, um, actually believed it to be illegal under UK copyright legislation. And then, of course, there is the impact on access to text for students with additional needs who require that print and down download allowance. And so the end result um, was actually that Pearson responded by reverting to their previous license, which allowed downloading and copying of 5%. Um, so that was um, a fantastic win from one of our supporters. Um, and then there was also an issue last year. So in August 2022, uh, bearing in mind this is just before the start of the new academic year over in European countries, um, Wiley abruptly removed over 1,300 titles from a key ProQuest ebook collection in the UK and Europe. Uh, it was one to which a lot of uni libraries subscribed and which contained titles on reading lists in many institutions. And at the same time, they were also trying to relabel many of these withdrawn titles as e textbooks and then subsequently market them on a subscription model. Um, and of course, we and others con condemn this move and the impact it was going to have on students. You know, this is right before the start of the academic year over there, um, where people have already done their reading lists. Um, so there was a joint statement from various Irish library associations, the Library Association of Ireland and some others, um, condemning the move. And the Irish Library Associations have been amazing from the start of the campaign. They've been really key allies to us. Um, and this statement was actually covered in the Irish media, so there's a link to a news, news article there. Um, and Student Union at University College Dublin as well also got behind this, so they issued a statement supporting the statement of the library associations and, you know, re-emphasising the impact this was going to have on students. And Dr Philip D'Souza, who uh, was at University College Dublin, also actually resigned his position as a contributor to the Wiley Encyclopedia of Ancient History due to, and I'll put the quote from him on the slide here, uh, due to the actions um, in regard to the ebook collections. Um, so he was actually driven to resign his position in protest to that. So in October 2022, Wiley said, yeah, they'll return the removed titles to the package until June 2023. So obviously that was a really fantastic win um, in terms of getting them back onto the package. And that was you know, really as a result of pressure from from mostly from Ireland, from the library associations there. Um, but of course it highlights, you know, the, the issues that we still have. So this was till June, 2023, which is next month. So what's gonna happen next month? Are these all going to disappear again? Um, and I've linked there to a blog post about, the, about this whole issue, um, which is up on our website, which you can read if you're interested to see that. 
And then something else we've been um, interested in and involved in conversations with is, is conversations about alternatives to the traditional model. So way back in 2020, um, when, as I said at the start, we were all trying to work out how to support our students doing dissertations of final products, um, loads of librarians crowdsourced, and I've put a link here, crowdsourced um, a spreadsheet of open access research methods, eBooks and other online resources around research methods to support our dissertation students. So on top of what we had in the collections, we um, we sort of crowdsourced um, this spreadsheet, which I certainly sent around to my faculties and, and sent to students as well. Um, we were also um, are a supporter of controlled digital lending, CDL. Um, if you're not sure what CDL is, um, to explain it in the context of book lending, it's the idea that libraries should be able to lend out digitised copies of works in their collection on a strict owned to loaned ratio. And the lending is controlled through the use of technological protection measures, which will prevent illicit copying and limit the length of loan period. So in effect, it gives libraries a choice between digital and physical formats in how to give access to works in their collection. So IFLA released their position on CDL um, in June 2021. Um, and this was very much driven by Ben White, who is someone who has done a lot within eBook OS as well. Um, so that was fantastic to see. And again, that's something we totally um, support. And we also support that through being signatories to Library Futures International Statement of Solidarity, which is supporting controlled digital lending and the necessary copyright updates to support that. So Library Futures are a US-based digital library policy and advocacy organization. And their aim is to preserve libraries' abilities to offer digital access to information. So this statement, calls for copyright reform, introduction to controlled digital lending, reasonable prices for libraries when we are buying things, and an investigation to what they call the market failure of licensing. And then last year, it was really great to be cited in Glyn Moody's book, Ward Culture, um, which looks critically at digital copyright. So our campaign was, was spoken about in that context as well. I've put a link to the book there. Of course, it is open access, so it's there for anyone to read. So in terms of support from the UK sector, um, in 2021, we were invited to join a working group with representatives from across the sector. That included people like SILIP, Professional Body, um, Sconnell and JISC, uh, Research Libraries UK, some um, purchasing consortia uh, were all involved in this working group. And in October of that year, um, a joint statement was released on behalf of that group, uh, behalf of the UK sector on access to ebook and e-textbook content, um, includes a number of documents. Again, I've put a link if anyone wants to look at it. Um, and it includes encouragement to library directors to actually support, support our submission to the Competition and Markets Authority. It includes information for us to share with academics um, and really sort of takes the position of, you know, we do need to, to be doing something about the issues. However, overall, I do have to say we have found support from the UK sector leaders to be generally lacking. So I said at the start, we're just three regular librarians doing this on top of our day job. Um, what we really needed were sector leaders to really take this on and drive it, because they're the people who have the power to do it. And unfortunately, you know, despite this joint statement we, and despite various promises, we just didn't get that support. We just didn't get people really, really raising it and, and taking it on. It really was kind of left to us. And you can really contrast that with other places. So I've got a slide here that just has a few examples of how it is a global issue. So I've mentioned already um, the Irish Library Association. Right from the start, they released a statement supporting goals of the campaign calling on the Irish government to launch a similar investigation. Uh, sector leaders in Ireland were on board straight away. And, you know, we met Library Futures, um, IFLA offered the support to the campaign. Our online presentations on our Twitter hashtag has participants from all over the world. And I've done a little, uh, little map here. Um, and the yellow dots all represent speaking engagements we've had either in person. So uh, Johanna and Caroline had some Europe trips last year or virtually. So uh, Johanna has presented uh, conferences virtually that were, were from uh, Canada and, and the US. Um, so these are, you know, where we've spoken and we've had uh, attendees from 
pretty much all over um, from, we've had attendees from Africa and Asia, for example, at some of our, our online um, presentations. So it really does illustrate that while we were speaking very much about the UK kind of state of things, it, it really did capture the global imagination. It really does seem to be a global issue. And then this year we've had a massive win in Ireland. And I say we, but this is all Library Association of Ireland um, that has done this. So as I said, they've been on board with us since it started. Irish sector leaders have been calling for change since it started. In February this year, there was a newspaper article in the Irish Examiner reporting that the Irish Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, the CCPC, is currently examining the restrictive terms applied to the licensing of ebooks in both public and academic libraries. So there it is. Their equivalent of the CMA is looking to actually take this on as a case. And that's completely because of the support that has come from high up people in Ireland. So that really demonstrates what can happen when the sector gets on board. I've also got a nice bit of breaking news for you as well uh, from a few weeks ago. Um, so as I've, I've put on the slide there, um, so various library associations from across Europe, I think it's 16 different countries, have signed a joint letter underlining the urgency to find ways to ensure that library users continue to be able to benefit from services in a digital world. This is signed by SILIP, the, broad, the professional body for the UK, and a bunch of other European countries as well. Calls for action on ebooks in terms of legal guarantees for rights to access and lend, better functioning platforms, and more research into the market. And this has been reported uh, and organised by Knowledge Rights 21. Um, this is a three year programme that really aims to mobilise the potential of Europe's knowledge institutions, particularly libraries, to engage with others um, across the whole spectrum of the access to knowledge movement to build momentum towards long term copyright reform that benefits, benefits library users and researchers. And Knowledge Rights 21 is supported by IFLA and Spark Europe, amongst others. So that's something for us to keep an eye on. It's something that's potentially really exciting as well. Um, so what's next? Um, well, we will continue to push the CMA. Um, we still send evidence to them. They have not said no to us. Um, so we still hope that one day they're going to take our case on. And we really hope that what's happening in Ireland with their Irish counterparts is going to set precedent. The open letter is still accepting signatures um, globally as well. Um, so if you would like to add yours, that'd be fantastic. Please do. And I've put a link on the slides. Um, or you can go to our website or find us on Twitter and you'll find a link there as well. We're still continuing to forge international connections and collaborations, and we will continue to be active on Twitter. So some of you might have joined in on the hashtag already. Uh, we don't have a Twitter account, but we have a hashtag ebookSOS um, where people jump on and you, know, you can share uh, if you've got a really horrendous example of pricing, pop it on there, put it in our spreadsheet as well. Um, just chat, ask questions, see what people are talking about, share any news that you've got that relates to anything around this access to book information. Okay, I think I am just about at time. So I think I've, I've timed this pretty well, which is great. Um, so I'm very happy, of course, to take questions in the remaining time. I've also got some questions for you to think about, you know, not necessarily now, um, but, you know, to go away from and reflect from when you reflect on the session. So is there a place for an ebook SOS campaign over here? Um, if so, what might it look like? So what are the key issues here? You know, is there a need for an investigation into the publishers here? And if so, you know, who would we lobby to do that? And then how does open access and copyright and lending rights, CDL fit in here as well? And what kind of actions would we take? So those are just a few questions for you, like I said, to, to go away and think about, you know, hop on the hashtag and, and have a chat to us. Um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions now that you have for me. And I'll just pop our information up there. Um, so we've got our campaign website. We have got an email address that's on the website. As I said, um, you can join us on Twitter using the ebook SOS hashtag. And we do have a GISC mail list. So GISC mail lists are mailing lists that are very well used in the UK, in the higher education and library sector. Um, so that's where we post announcements as well. Um, totally open to anyone. Um, so feel free to, to join that as well. So if you, I should have put a link there, actually. I was forgetting that you might not know what GISC mail lists are. Um, if you Google GISC mail lists, um, you'll, you'll find the website to sign up for that. OK, um, I think that's all I had to, to say. So I'll put my video back on. Thank you, everyone.
Thank you so much, Rachel, for walking us through the campaign from its very beginnings all the way through to where you are now. And it just really strikes me how these sorts of campaigns have lives other than their own, other than you intended when you begin mm -hmm. to get that groundswell of public support, media attention, links with other groups. Um, and it's really fascinating to see also how it's now evolving with all the connections you're building with other groups and related issues as well. Um, and I will hand back to Ginny to handle the Q&A. And certainly those are some of the themes we're seeing come through in the questions in the chat already. So I would really encourage you both to put your questions in the chat. And has, as Rachel has said, for us to also um, put our thoughts and responses together about how we may um, advance some of these issues and um, campaigns in Australia as well. So back over to you, Ginny, and thank you again so much, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona, and thanks, Rachel. That was a fantastic presentation. I really enjoyed it. It's really great to see sort of um, this kind of powerful advocacy done really well. So you obviously captured the imagination at the, at the perfect moment, which is sometimes the key to doing these mm -hmm. things, I think. So the questions are pouring in. So I'm going to start at the top <laughs> and then I'll um, aim to put, put see if I can put some of them together. So the first one was actually from Fiona. Mm -hmm. And she said, how much power do authors have about how accessible they're work is to libraries and what conversations can they, the authors have with um, librarians and publishers to improve access? Yeah, I think that is a, a tricky one because, you know, to some extent, you know, they do, they do have the power in terms of deciding who to publish with. And that's very much why we, we got that guide put together, the Can My Students Read My Book Guide, um, to give them, uh, there's a whole list of questions there they can ask a publisher. Um, and even a, a clause that, that was written by someone who knows about this side of things, um, about something they can, you know, put put into their contract. Um, so in theory, yes, you know, they should they can choose who to publish with and they can be asking these questions. Um, but of course, you know, being realistic, you know, it's not probably not the case that everybody can just take their monograph to whichever publisher they want and it gets accepted. There's that element of it as well. Um, I think something that will impact on this as well that I've certainly noticed since I've been working in Australia is um, open access policies. So um, I know our university's policy says that, um, you know, the, the university's requirements for things to be open access does cover monographs as well. Um, and I know, for example, the um, I know the ARC open access policy does sort of say that, you know, it, you, sh you should do your best to get your open access monograph if it has been funded by ARC funding to get it published open access. Um, and, you know, that's a whole other question. I've, I've had discussions with academics about that as well, because obviously the, the open access book um, kind of situation is very, very different to what we have with journals. But I wonder if that will impact it, if people more and more are going to have that um, requirement to actually make their monograph open access. Um, that obviously is going to, to to figure a part of it as well. So um, I think there's I think there's still stuff to watch there. Um, I think conversation wise, um, which this is what we were trying to do with the guide as well, is really encourage um, academics to talk to their academic like liaison librarian. This was something we emphasised um, in the version that we created for my old place of work. So it's really like, you know, when you're thinking about publishing, please come and talk to us. You know, we can we can sort of give you an idea of questions to ask. We can tell you about the issues with ebooks as well. Um, so, yeah, it's it's not necessarily that they always have that power, but I think that will change with open access funder mandates. Yeah, and so I guess so related to that, I'm just jumping down the questions a, um, from Hugh Rundle has asked whether you've got links with the OER publishing initiatives directly, because that that does talk to that thing about the power that authors have. Is that a group that you've had direct conversations with? We haven't, no, no, we haven't um, spoken with any kind of OER publishing initiatives, but um, absolutely, that is one way that, that can get past this. Um, I think it's I think the only thing there is um, it's important to remember that I know OER can mean anything open, but it, when we talk about it, it tends to be used in terms of textbooks, I think, a lot. Uh, and it's also worth sort of bearing in mind that there are maybe other types of books, particularly in the arts and humanities, that wouldn't come under that textbook um, kind of mantle. Um, which might kind of fall out of that. But certainly, you know, OER, I didn't specifically mention OER in the slides, but 
um, I think it probably goes without saying that we're very, very supportive of open access, and that definitely includes OER publishing initiatives. Um, and you're absolutely right, it, it attacks that problem in the ways I'm just looking at what he has written there. Um, absolutely, it, you know, it, it brings in the, that Creative Commons license and, and gets past that side of things. Yeah, um, and there is actually an active OER group, very active OER group in mm. Australia. So, um, I'm, and there's some people from that on this call that I can see. Yeah. Um, so just going again, going back to the top. So it is interesting. Do you think that journal, uh, the question about whether libraries are significantly increasing their print acquisitions in response to this? I mean, that seems like a rather retrograde step. But are you seeing that happening? Um, I haven't seen that in the UK. Um, I know it was sort of something that, that people were talking about. But I think so many libraries already had an e-first policy. And like you said, it would feel like a step back. Um, so I don't, I'm not aware that anyone's kind of significantly done that. Um, yeah, it was kind of, I, I, when in my old job, I worked quite closely with some of the art subjects who tended to be a lot more attached to print anyway, in some ways for good reason, because a lot of the times the books weren't available as e-books um, or there would be quality issues. Um, so there was kind of more of a push for print there. But no, I, I personally haven't seen um, that kind of removal back to, to using print because, of course, ebooks do have advantages, especially I think since the pandemic. I know here in Australia, there's always been a big distance learning and remote learning um, kind of cohort. Uh, but in other countries where that hasn't maybe been such a big thing, I think we're seeing more of that and more kind of hybrid learning. So it still is really important, even though the physical libraries are open to have the online material as well. So um, I think a lot of people are kind of interested in ideas of controlled digital lending and that kind of thing, because that really, in a way, can kind of bypass some of the problems um, without sort of having to revert to print, because CDL would allow us to um, to basically, you know, treat them both the same in, in this essence. But obviously, there's copyright reforms that, that need to be done there. So that's, that's way bigger than us. But I think a lot of people are quite interested in that idea. Yeah. Um, Janet Cashwell had a question about what do you see the future for accessible books? So that's quite a quite of a big, big question. <laughs> but I just wondered if I could tie it into one a question that I had, which is that you said that you found it hard to get high level buy in across in the sector in the U UK. Do you think that's because there's a lack of understanding or do you think that is because there was lobbying against it or, or what? Just a kind of questions about where you think this might might be going and what, what are the drivers to making this happen or not happen yeah so I think I, I I think the impression we got about the lack of support in the UK sector um I think a lot of it was actually not wanting to upset publishers um and I appreciate that in some cases so for example GISC are the organization who do a lot of the negotiations with publishers um for the the packages and, and deals that that university libraries buy there so I can understand that they're sort of they've got a foot in both camp but you know other sector leaders um just from conversations we heard or or things that we, we did sometimes have people who were a little bit higher up than us who we were on good terms with kind of you know let us know that maybe certain things have been said um, and it really sounded like a lot of people um, just didn't see rocking the boat as being worth it. We even heard this idea that it could make it worse. Well, our feeling was, you know, it couldn't really get much worse, you know, with the, the issues that we were having. Um, so certainly in the UK, I feel like there was a reluctance to, to rock the boat and a reluctance to to kind of open up what comes next because you know leading to the question of, of what what happens you know like you said it's a massive question and I think there needs to be a lot of very 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 high level change um in terms of copyright you know we we're talking about controlled digital lending um in terms of open access um you know I was saying just now open access books are not we, we don't have the things for open access books we have for open access journals that one is developed and then also we're not talking about journals today, but of course, there's also the issue of um, transformative agreements, which actually aren't very potentially very transformative and are a nice kind of way for publishers to make money. We don't want to fall into that trap either. Um, so there's a lot of reform um, that that needs to be done. And I think I think what we see as the future is being a really good balance of open access monographs, OER, CDL, um, 
and then you know the fact is that sometimes we still will need to buy things so giving that arts examples sometimes they use older books that haven't been digitized yet we still need to buy those things or some more specialist things so i think what we see is that there's not just one solution it's having a uh, a kind of balance of all of those and that's why we're still pushing for this investigation we're not just promoting the alternatives supporting cdl we're actually still pushing for this investigation into the industry um to try and solve the problems that are still there with the books that we are buying i think that's a, that's a really great perspective the need to have an overall look at it rather than you know kind of picking out individual parts which maybe don't make a sort of coherent sense and then that potentially makes it harder for you know people to ignore the need to to change things um so yeah so get, just going on to the questions uh, ash barber's got a question she said uh, says what what support of stakeholder groups do you feel have had the most success with in terms of getting them on board um or is it individual or individuals i'd love to hear your thoughts for how you've managed to who, who's been most supportive as it were yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, like I kept saying all the way through the the Irish library community um, were straight away, um, you know, from the start of the campaign, we we made connections via Twitter with library directors in Ireland um, who were really, really on board with it straight away. And obviously, because they're influential people, they were able to to kind of you know, get people on board that way as well. Um, I think a big issue with with the the lack of support in the UK, you know, not just that it it potentially impedes that that influence. There's also, I think, there probably is an element of people who don't really want to listen to what three kind of ordinary librarians, uh, potentially three female ordinary librarians, uh, have to say. Um, but even without that, I think when you when you have that support from library directors and people like that, you they just have more kind of, I suppose, more access to influence. They've got more people to talk to um, that really, really um, made a difference. Um, students as well. That's been quite varied. So kind of individually, you know, when we've spoken to students at our institutions, um, we've had a uh, students sign the open letter um, we've had kind of individual student unions at certain universities I gave the example of Dublin but there's some at the UK as well who kind of written statements and encouraged their um, encourage their students to, to sign up for it um, again very much because it was about the student impact you know the impact on students not being able to access things um, but interestingly sort of the, the kind of national union of students in the UK as a, a whole didn't really we tried to contact them quite a bit they didn't really kind of um do really sort of get on board with it so that was interesting that was more of a kind of individual thing in individual thing um so yeah it's it's really varied and again academics some of them have sort of jumped in straight away and um, what we found helpful something that we did at my institution in 2020 was actually to run staff development sessions that were just we just called them the ebook landscape and we just explained the issues in ways that they could understand, like this book that you wanted for your course was going to cost, you know, X thousand of pounds. Um, and that kind of that transparency really helped as well to get academics on board, I think. And certainly um, we did get people, we did get academics thinking about revising their reading lists and their course readings after that and actually bringing in. Um, OER or looking for open access or just looking for alternatives that were were simply available so yeah it's been um it's been more it's been quite an individual thing I, you know I can't really say there's one set of stakeholders or one set of supporters that have really um been the most successful it's just yeah it's been interesting to see again that example with Ireland where the library directors there um just took action straight away in comparison to what happened in the UK um yeah it's it's I don't know I don't know why that is but there really just seemed to be a difference there it's often just what you know often takes one individual within an organization to kind of get it doesn't it that mm. then drives it forward I think um, so. and, it, and it was interesting you're saying about the National Union of Students not not having particularly got on board because they seem like a very obvious group that ought to be engaged but sometimes it's yeah. a question of bandwidth isn't it that yeah that's it and I think you're right there I think you know in the individual universities and their individual unions we were able to maybe find those people who really understood and were like oh yeah actually this is not you know just a library issue this is impacting the students there's a very rich discussion going on in the chat 
<laughs> it's not not all questions. I won't. I won't. Um, I won't. Uh, I'll point people to have a quick look at it, but I won't um, ask you about them. I, we're just get, drawing this to a, a close because I do want to finish on the hour. I just wonder: is there one message you'd like to kind of give to this um, the community within Australia and New Zealand of what you would like us to take away from this? What would you, what action would you like um, people on this call to do to sort of help move this forward? Um, oh, that's a really good question. Uh, I'm just I'm having a look at uh, what's been put in the chat. Um, I think because I'm still relatively new to Australia and this part of the world as a whole, I possibly don't um, quite understand how the situation has played out here over the past few years. So I think what I would really love to do for people to do is to go away and spend some time reflecting on the questions that I raised um, on what we might want to do here, who the stakeholders might be, what actions we might want to take. Um, and then come back to us. So join us on Twitter or drop us an email and, you know, let's, let's see maybe what we can do here. Fantastic. Yeah, there's a rich set of resources, um, one of the uh, which on your website. And there's also a few things that people have chat, put to in the chat themselves. I, I think mm. it would be, I, again, I, I, I agree with you, very worth, worthwhile people reflecting on what you've already put out there. And if you're willing to speak to other groups, maybe we can we can people can get in touch with you directly about Absolutely. that, because I, I really appreciate the need to. It's a sort of constant need to raise awareness about these kind of things and make sure that you know that uh, it get the message gets out sort of widely. So, um, I'll draw this to an end. Thank you very much for that. That was a fantastic talk. I think we had uh, we've had more than a hundred people on the call. Um, we had a, a a high group signed up, and I know that many people will look at this when we put it up on our website, which we will do shortly. Um, I would really encourage anyone on the call to look at the resources that Rachel's provided. Um, feel free and please do tweet about this. Make sure that you are um, kind of disseminating it. And yes, if there's any, any other questions, then I guess, Rachel, you're the person to go to about this. And please keep in touch with us about any future developments. We, um, we have a newsletter at Open Access Australasia and we're very happy to share anything there um, that news you'd like to do. Fabulous. I'm just dropping my email address in the chat. If people are on Twitter, you can always get me on Twitter. But if you're not, uh, oh, apologies, I sent that to Sandra directly rather than to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just drop my um, my work email in the chat for you. So if anyone wants to get in touch, uh, please do. Great. Thank you very much, Rachel. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Ginny.